Great, thank you very much for inviting me to, uh, to give this presentation. Um, what I'd like to do uh, today is kind of provide a bit of a, a background that will hopefully uh, form a bit of the basis of the more kind of complicated, uh, complex talks that you're going to hear later on uh, this morning and this afternoon uh, that are going to uh, really uh, go into much more deeper detail than the things I'm going to talk about, hence my acronym. Um, and when I mentioned this title to some of my students, they actually didn't know what KISS was. And, uh, and I said, well, it's a rock band, um, but also uh, means keep it simple, stupid. And so that's what I'm going to uh, really talk about is how we can use even very simple acquisitions and uh, pretty straightforward um, analysis routines and still get a lot of useful information from diffusion uh, imaging. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about. And uh, one caveat. Um, this is my background. I'm actually a chemist. I'm not a neuroscientist or a physicist. I've got a chemistry background, so it might be a bit odd what I'm doing. But, uh, and, and henceforth, there'll be very few equations in the, uh, in the talk. There'll be, I think, one equation. Um, there'll be no magic, so there'll be no magic at all. And we'll try to keep it simple. All right. So what is it that diffusion imaging uh, really, uh, we, we try to do with diffusion imaging? Well, we're trying to look at the brain microstructure. We're, like, we're trying to see, uh, get some way of quantifying myelin, uh, axon, uh, health, et cetera, non-invasively um, in the human brain. And you know, we don't have a microscope that can do that. We need an MR microscope that can look into the brain. And you know, we might have a 3T or might have to bump the resolution up of our microscope to a 7 Tesla. And the idea is to basically get our sample onto our slide, and this was our it's the craziest mascot I've ever seen for a school. But, um, and then try to put our sample into the magnet, maybe not a metal keg, and then try to uh, under, uh, investigate what's going on in that brain microstructure using non-invasive diffusion imaging techniques. And what we'd like to be able to do is, is bridge these two things. You know, we get these uh, anisotropy maps and tractography, which I'm going to explain. And I am going to go into some of the basics, assuming that a uh, bunch of people here don't know what diffusion imaging is. And um, what we'd like to do is link that up with axons, myelin content. Do we have ordered wiring or, or kind of a mess of wiring? It's this kind of link that we'd like to try to uh, understand. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, five parts. So we're going to have some diffusion basics, which I'm going to try to go through re reasonably quickly so I can get to our uh, actual data. I'm going to talk about what tensor-based tractography is like, and, and these are just going to be in very general terms. Then I'm going to talk about some of our post-surgical DTI studies, which we actually use the subjects to try to understand what's happening, what diffusion measurements are actually telling us, as opposed to the kind of other way around. Um, quickly touch on uh, some of these small world networks a la DTI. We saw some of this, uh, these networks yesterday. I'm just going to briefly introduce it that we can do it with DTI as well. And then just a couple of examples um, of some high field diffusion imaging to follow up some of the high field fMRI that we saw yesterday and some of the same benefits you'll see for diffusion imaging. So what is diffusion? Well, diffusion classically is mixing kind of due to a concentration gradient where you have things moving uh, from a more concentrated state to a less concentrated state. And you normally tag all the molecules with a radioactive tracer and watch it diffuse, see how far it moves, and then calculate the diffusion coefficient. But in fact, we don't have these concentration gradients uh, in the tissue. Uh, we have uh, basically Brownian motion due to thermal energy, where the water molecules, which is our main molecule that we're interested in looking at, um, although you can measure diffusion of metabolites like NaA, creatine, and choline as well, or anything else you can measure with MR, uh, you get these Brownian motion, this random, random motion uh, known as Brownian motion. And this guy here, not this guy, came up with this uh, displacement uh, that if you could measure the displacement and you knew how long you were measuring diffusion uh, for, you could calculate the diffusion coefficient. And that's really the, the powerful thing. And maybe that's the magic, the fact that we can measure uh, displacements on the order of microns uh, in the human brain is kind of, I guess that's magic. And how do you measure that? Well, it goes back to a couple of chemists in 1964, 65, where they had the pulse gradient spin echo measurement, where you have a spin echo 90 and 180. And what you do is you apply these gradients. One is to uh, label all the spins, all the water molecules, as to where they're located in the brain. And then the second one 
basically queries where they've moved to during this period of time right here. And so, you know, we can't do radioactive labeling. So this is our labeling. We label with phase, MR phase. And if we have diffusion, then we lose some signal attenuation, some signal, and we can calculate then diffusion coefficients and et cetera. And this uh, parameter B, B value, you're going to hear that in some of the later talks, um, it's a function of the strength of these gradients, and it's basically a measure of the diffusion sensitivity. Okay, so that's, that's my one equation. That's about as complex as I get. All right, so wh what's interesting about diffusion is that uh, it samples the cellular microstructure. Okay, so that's what's really quite interesting, um, is that the water molecules are moving around, bumping into cell membranes, they have intracellular space, they're in the extracellular space, and what we're doing is inferring the microstructure from what the water is doing, how far it's moving and what direction. And that's why it's known as the, the diffusion coefficient is called the apparent diffusion coefficient or the ADC. And the values range from maybe 0.3 to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 3 millimeters squared per second. And you get water displacements of about 5 to 11 microns in the brain. Uh, in about 40 milliseconds or so is what our measurement time scale usually is. So we're measuring very small water displacements. So although we have a very uh, coarse resolution, we're actually measuring things at the micron scale. And I think that's an important point to make. And another uh, important thing is that we can see uh, diffusion anisotropy. So these are uh, electron micrographs of uh, an axon. There's myelin. There's the axon running that way. And it turns out that diffusion is much faster along the axons uh, than perpendicular due to a number of reasons, axon membranes, myelin, et cetera, things that impede those water molecules from moving sideways. And you can characterize the diffusion parallel and perpendicular by these eigenvalues, lambda 1, lambda 2, and lambda 3, where the lambda 1 is the faster diffusion parallel and lambda 2 and 3 is the slower diffusion perpendicular. And then you can calculate uh, maps such as this, parametric maps, mean diffusivity, and basically things that are bright, things have diffused much further. If it's dark, it, they haven't diffused as far, so that's why the CSF is bright, the water moves around much faster. And then fractional anisotropy, or FA, which is something we're going to really be talking about throughout the talk, uh, is really an indicator as to whether the diffusion is more elliptical or elongated or anisotropic. And that's like, it, you know, pulls out the nice white matter areas. And then an FA of zero, uh, where things are black, means that it's basically the diffusion is basically isotropic. It's the same in all directions. Okay. And what's important to keep in mind is, so you know, you have a lot of voxels obviously throughout your image, and the resolution is quite coarse. You know, it might be two point by two millimeters squared in plane, two to five millimeter slices, and that little blue box is that. Um, but what we're measuring at is at this level. The wa what the water is doing at the microscopic level. Okay? And then what we're trying to infer is from the intensity of this map here, what's going on at this level. Okay? And, you'll, and we'll see that that's a bit of a challenge. Um, and there's about you know, 10 to the 20 water molecules per voxel. So obviously the water molecules all, all better be doing something quite similar in here because we're just measuring an average all over all those water molecules in that voxel to get that intensity. So it's a bit of a challenge for interpretation, but we'll talk a bit about that as well. Um, this was my postdoctoral supervisor back in 1995, and um, you know, basically the, this idea of diffusion anisotropy really came out in this June 1990 workshop. So you know, workshops are quite useful, and he basically said that you know, understood that the idea that the water diffusion or anisotropy was kind of linked to the underlying tissue microstructure. And this, and actually, September of 1990 is when I started doing uh, diffusion work. So right after this. And so what are the relative micro microstructural contributions? Well, we have myelin sheaths, we have exonal membranes, we have cytoskeletons. And there's been a bunch of research that has tried to tease out those various contributions. And it turns out that axonal membranes or membrane density seems to be the most important, while myelin sheaths can kind of modulate things. And here's just an example where uh, anisotropy is rather nonspecific. So here's a bunch of electron micrographs of six different nerve fibers. Okay, you got some myelinated ones here. Uh, you got some peripheral, some central nerve. You got some non-myelinated axons. Here's some non-myelinated ones, and so on. And you say, okay, can can I predict which one's going to have the highest degree of anisotropy? And it turns out that if you measure the FA, um, here's 0.59. You know, they're all pretty much pretty high and pretty similar, right? The Non-myelinated one is the same as the 
completely myelinated uh, nerve fiber right beside it. And then what's you know, even more interesting is that the top three are from fish, garfish. This is a lobster, here's a frog, and there's a human brain. So basically a nerve is a nerve is a nerve, and the components aren't really, uh, you know, you can't put something in and tell which one it is. You can't even tell what species it's from. So, but not, all is not lost, because what we do in, 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 in our scientific experiments is we compare, uh, you know, apples to apples, not apples to oranges. So one can't measure, for example, an anisotropy parameter in an optic radiation and, and say, oh, it's got a higher FA, therefore it's more myelinated than a cortical spinal tract. Uh, we can't do that. But what we can do is try to compare apples to apples and say if we have controls in patients and we keep our experiments and our analysis methods the same, we can then look for differences and then try to infer, obviously, uh, if there's what the microstructural differences might be. And the other that thing that's quite interesting is that um, we talked about these eigenvalues that not all FA reductions are the same. So when people look at patient studies, they measure this degree of anisotropy, it goes down. And the, the question is, well, how do we interpret that? Well, it turns out that this ellipse here, this diffusion ellipse is, say, a normal FA, and I've got some lambda 1s, 2s, and 3s here in ADC value. These have dropped by 20%, but this is because the lambda 1 has dropped down, and the lambda 2 and lambda 3 have stayed the same. Whereas in this case here, lambda 2 and lambda 3, you got a fatter ellipse. So the anisotropies are the same here, but you wouldn't interpret those uh, the same. So uh, one important point is that it's important to also look at your underlying um, data that the FA is calculated from, whereas a lot of people just look at the FA values. And one of the things that we're going to talk about in the post-surgical cases is this idea of Wallerian degeneration, where the axons and the myelin sheaths all kind of start to degrade after some type of injury. And in a normal case, you might have nice ellipsoids, which is defining the diffusion uh, like this. But what you might have is uh, axon gen degeneration and beating of the axon, which will kind of slow things down parallel. And I kind of liken that to you know, a traffic jam trying to get out of Montreal, or in Alberta, more of a, more of a cow jam. Um, and whereas the second thing that happens is myelin degradation and loss, and therefore the diffusion, the water molecules can go more perpendicular, right? So there's this notion that, you know, kind of like opening up the dam perpendicular and the water can get out. So, the, the, and this, this was really nicely showed by Victor Song back in 2003, where he injured, uh, the, you know, mouse optic nerve ischemia, and what he saw was, you know, the FA was going down post-injury, but what he saw that was interesting was that uh, ADC parallel went down first with no change in the perpendicular diffusion. So that would fit with the idea that the axons are beating, there's problems with the water moving down the axons, and then only later uh, did you get the elevations in perpendicular diffusion where the myelin's degrading. So the idea that these uh, eigenvalues might be giving you more selective information about the microstructure, although not specific, um, was quite promising. And we're going to talk a bit about that when we get to the post-surgical stuff. Now, quickly to talk about um, uh, diffusion tensor, this was uh, from Peter Basser back in uh, 1994. And uh, you, you're going to see later on that people are going to go beyond the tensor uh, to more complex models. Um, this is the most simple model where you need at least six diffusion measurements per slice. You can measure diffusion in a bunch of different directions by changing the gradients, those gradients, those little yellow gradient boxes I, that we applied. You can measure diffusion in different directions and query which way those water molecules are moving the most. And if you measure, this is the kind of the DTI pyramid, if you measure, uh, say, six different diffusion directions and a B0, which is a non-diffusion weighted image, you can then calculate apparent diffusion coefficient maps in each direction. You can then calculate the eigenvalues. And then you can calculate the mean diffusivity and, and FA maps that we talked about before. So this is the data that you need. And you're going to see that uh, what people are doing now is not just acquiring six directions. They might be acquiring hundreds of these diffusion directions and then doing much more sophisticated modeling uh, to get more information than, than these parametric maps. But I'm not going to be talking about those uh, today. The other important thing is that you can get directionality with diffusion imaging, <clears throat> and that's indicated here on this color map where uh, green is anterior posterior where the water diffuses more quickly in that direction, blue is inferior superior, and red is left to right. 
So once again, that the, the diffusion is giving you some information about the microstructure. And what we're assuming to do tractography is this is a voxel, and the water is diffusing faster parallel uh, to the axons than perpendicular. And so we measure all those water molecules within that voxel, and then we basically play a very fancy uh, connect the dots, and we basically connect that voxel to the next voxel to the next voxel, and if they're all pointing in the same direction and they all have the same, uh, a certain FA threshold, then we can kind of connect all those dots, and then we make up what's known as a tract or a streamline, okay? And this is the corpus callosum, uh, genu of the corpus callosum of my uh, former PhD student, Luis Concha, who's now a assistant professor in Caletico, Mexico, and he made the nice movie. So the idea is that you can go from microscopic water diffusion to brain wiring. And then once you have the brain wiring, what you're going to see in the talk is that we're going to use that to then uh, get some quantitative numbers and try to use it to understand what's happening with age, what's happening in a certain patient population, and so on. And the way you do tractography is you, you, know, you, know, you basically draw regions of interest on your FA maps and ask what streamlines are passing through there. And then you know, there's the cingulum, and here's the fornix, and so on. All right, but the important thing to keep in mind is so that you can define all these different tracks, and, but they're not perfect, right? You're gonna be missing stuff. You're gonna hear later that with uh, fancier models, you can, you can get a lot more fibers, better connectivity measurements, if you will. So while we should probably say that, you know, FA was measured in the voxels identified with this specific algorithm on those images acquired with that protocol, probably on that scanner, and that appears to correspond to where the cingulum ought to be, given our a priori knowledge. In papers, we just basically say FA was measured in the cingulum. Understanding that we may not be measuring all of the cingulum, there may be other stuff in there as well. It's a simplification, but it's the best that we can do. One of the things that we've developed um, to try to look at uh, large populations is kind of more automated, semi-automated tractography, because um, so we try to normalize the uh, diffusion-weighted images. We try to put the seed regions then on a, uh, on a template, deform those seed regions for the tractography, and then do fiber tracking back in native space for all the subjects. And the reason we want to do that is because uh, some of our projects, we have four or 500 subjects. And if we want to look at 20 tracks per person times 400 subjects, you know, it's going to take the grad student a long time. And uh, it, won't, it won't affect me, actually, but um, <laughs> they don't like that. So what we have is Alexander Lehman's modified his Explore DTI software. And then we can extract these tracks in, in all the subjects and maybe look through, you know, I still have to look through them and verify that it worked out reasonably well. And then you calculate, say, an FA for the whole tract and, or an MD parameter or whatever you want. And uh, Catherine LaBelle then looked at, so I'll just give a few examples of how we've used then this tractography more as a 3D uh, region of interest. And so this is just an example in healthy aging, um, pretty, pretty straightforward, a bunch of people different ages, and you can calculate FAs in different tracks. And what's kind of cool is that there's a bunch of grouping of tracks that are mostly developed by 13 years where the FA kind of goes up and then levels off. You will notice that there's a ton of scatter um, so FA is a very noisy kind of parameter, lots of variability between people. Here's our, our tracks that mostly develop by 18 to 22 years. And then you have other tracks like the cingulum, more the frontal temporal tracks and the unsubsiculus that are still going up in the 20s. Right? So that's kind of interesting. And you can use this as a kind of a quantitative tool to, to follow these neurodevelopmental processes. Unfortunately for all of us that are past those ages, what goes up must come down. And we can do the same thing. Now we have 403 healthy people from 5 to 83. And this is all acquired with the same protocol and the same scanner. Um, and you, know, you have early peaking tracks that peak around 20, 25 years of age. And then they start going down. So here's the genu of the corpus callosum. The red dots are female, blue dots are males. Not really much difference. They have intermediate peaking ones around 27 to 30 years of age. I mean, although it's pretty, you know, there's a pretty flat, broad peak here, so don't get too depressed. And then uh, late peaking around 35 to 42, okay? 
So we can sort of measure these, these uh, changes, and people are interested in trying to use these measures then to look at healthy aging versus um, pathologies that, uh, where the aging process isn't so kind. And what we can do is, is create these type of uh, timing maps, these kind of uh, maps where you uh, show what the timing of white matter development is. And these are the different uh, tracks. I'm not going to define them all. But what we have is the, the, the little black line indicates that peak where it went up and then came, started coming back down. You can see some like the fornix and genu peak early, um, and then others like the cingulum and cortical spinal tract and the uncinate peak quite late. And so what we hope is that this can form sort of a basis set to then compare to clinical populations. And the colors just uh, indicate the degree of, of change of the, of the parameter, in this case, fractional anisotropy. And then you can also do longitudinal studies. And this was just a follow-up from those original studies. And what was interesting is they were scanned about four years apart. And so here's the cortical spinal tract. And this, the colors represent the percent of subjects that either went up with FA, that's green, stayed the same with FA blue, or went down with FA. And you can see that in 5 to 11-year-olds, about 50%, 60% or so are, are increasing of FA between those four years. And then that gradually goes down until the 20s where really not too many people are, are going up. And in fact, the proportion of FAs going down is increasing. What's, what we found was most interesting was that association tracks like the IFO, um, even in the 20s, 22 to 32, 40%, 40 to 50% of people were still increasing their uh, FA. So the, you know, the white matter tracks were still developing. Uh, in the 22 to 32 year age range. And you, get, you just lose that when you have the cross-sectional data given the scatter. So I think longitudinal studies are really going to become much more powerful tools uh, for diffusion analysis in, in, in the future. One of our other projects, just to give another example of how we're using this brain wiring, um, to, is comparing uh, children with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder where the brain is injured by uh, alcohol ingestion during pregnancy. And all the areas that are kind of blue, red, uh, and yellow are, area, are tracks that had significant diffusion differences between controls and subjects diagnosed with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And you can see that there's quite a bit of bilateral, a lot of tracks that are injured uh, in this. It's a very prevalent disorder, um, unfortunately, completely preventable. And uh, you know, it, it demonstrates that there's kind of a widespread network that's affected um, by this type of injury. I'm going to skip the math correlation. So for post-surgical uh, DTI studies, what I'd like to talk about is this idea that we can use the um, parallel and perpendicular diffusion coefficients in order to try to get a better handle on what's happening with the tissue microstructure. Okay, And um, I'm going to just really quickly cover three different projects. Uh, and the idea is that uh, we're looking at patients that have epilepsy who then have neurosurgery. And what we're going to do is we're going to scan them before they have surgery, and then we're going to scan them after they have surgery and see what happens. So we, have a, we know when the, the uh, transection is, we know what the injury is, we know where it is, and then we can follow it longitudinally in that person and see if those diffusion parameters are fitting with what we saw in that Victor Song kind of animal model. So I'm going to talk about some temporal lobe epilepsy here, some histological correlates with the fornix, some drop attack seizures, and then some, some more temporal lobe epilepsy. And this was work all done by uh, Luis Concha and uh, Min Liu, current PhD student. So we know in temporal lobe epilepsy that in, often in cases you have a shrunken hippocampus, hippocampal sclerosis, and then there's surgery to remove the hippocampus. So what's, but the major efferent white matter tract is the fornix from the hippocampus. So what's kind of, and there's also a tale of two, two TLEs. There's also non-lesional temporal lobe epilepsy where the hippocampus isn't shrunken. And what's interesting is that uh, from an early study, we, this is the fornix, and it's color-coded with fractional anisotropy. So red is going to be higher FA, blue is be lower FA. And if you have controls, you have lots of nice red. And if you have temporal lobe epilepsy with mesial temporal sclerosis, or that shrunken hippocampus, you see a lot more blue. And if you have no MTS, it's, it's not quite as blue. So basically, the idea is that these two MTS, uh, these two TLE groups, uh, have different degrees of anisotropy. And that's shown here. Right? So the MTS group has the lowest anisotropy, 
There's the non-MTS and there's controls. So the tractography tells us that there's something different about these fornices. The question is, how, how do we know what's different? Well, what, what do you have to do? Well, what you have to do is get a piece of that fornix from the patient. And so what the neurosurgeon did is while he's pulling out the temporal lobe, he actually takes out a piece of the, the fornix that he's taking out anyhow and puts it in a, in a little fixative jar for us. And that's a piece of it right there, right? There it is here and then, then it's gone. And then, and then what we can do is do electron microscopy, compare that to the DTI we did pre-surgical and do a correlation and see what's going on. And you can measure, you know, axon density, degree of myelin, et cetera, et cetera. And so what was interesting about this, we already know the FA's fornix is higher in the no sclerosis group. And when we looked at the electron microscopy, here's the no hippocampal sclerosis group and here's the, here's the hippocampal sclerosis group. You can see a lot, you know, bigger empty spaces, basically, less axons and so on in, in those. And when you do a kind of a quantitative analysis over the entire group, um, we saw group differences in axon membrane circumference, myelin fraction, extra axonal fraction, axon density. So this was a nice case where the DTI predicted there was going to be a microstructural change, and when we looked at the microstructure, in fact, it was different between the two groups. And that matched up. And then if you did some correlations, uh, you know, small sample size, I mean, this type of project, you can't do this kind of project in hundreds of subjects. Um, and what you see is that if you, this is a cumulative axon membrane circumference, so basically sum up all the membrane circumference. And if you have more membranes, you have higher anisotropy. Less membranes, you have lower anisotropy. So it fit with all the animal work and everything else that we had done in the past. And this was mainly driven by a reduction in the perpendicular diffusion, which also fits with that kind of more selective notion of the uh, eigenvalues. So that was kind of uh, interesting. It was kind of a kind of human confirmation of what we're looking at with diffusion imaging. Uh, the second project's on drop attack seizures. These are patients that, and once again, these, these studies are all very small. Um, but what's nice is that you can show individual data and show how consistent it is. So this is three subjects that have drop attack seizures, and then they have surgery where they transect basically the anterior two-thirds of the corpus callosum uh, to control the seizures. And so this is just a control subject over time showing that we can do deterministic tractography quite uh, reproducibly. The FA values don't change very much and so on over a course of several months. If you do callosotomy and you cut that corpus callosum, your FA obviously goes down considerably. This is at eight days and then this is at 60 days, okay? Now the question is, are these FA reductions the same? Right? If you just measured FA, they look pretty, pretty similar, right? They're blue, lower FA. Well, if you look at the eigenvalues, you see something very interesting. So here, uh, hot values are always a uh, higher value. So this is parallel diffusivity. You can see lots of good high parallel diffusion prior to the surgery. Post-surgery, the parallel diffusion drops like a rock, and then it kind of recovers slightly at 60 days. So this reduction of parallel diffusion matches quite nicely with that axon beating uh, hypothesis. If you look at perpendicular diffusion, it's blue, it's low, you expect it to be low. It goes up a little bit uh, at eight days, and then it goes up a lot at 60 days. So the idea that, that this is kind of uh, highlighting the demyelination. And if you look at actual plots of the FA, MD, parallel diffusion at the three time points, well, you see, we'll just focus on parallel and perpendicular diffusion. You see the parallel diffusion, each patient's plotted here, kind of goes down uh, for, and then goes back up. And that's for the genuine body. That's why you see six kind of plots here. So the parallel diffusion goes down and then it's kind of pseudo-normalizes at two to four months. Perpendicular diffusion doesn't change very much and then goes up. So here's your axon damage plugging up the highway. And then here's the perpendicular diffusion with the dam opening up. Uh, at later time points. Fits very beautifully with the uh, animal model uh, that we talked about earlier. Now, the one issue with that study was that we looked at eight days, and um, we didn't look at uh, what, what happens during the first week. Now, that's much more challenging, to put somebody who's just had brain surgery uh, into the scanner. But, um, you know, these epilepsy patients are, are very m motivated patients, and um, 
the surgeon uh, was able, we've been able to look at, um, we're up to six now, but I'm just going to present about four. We looked at four patients that have scanned pre-surgery and then four times in the first week. Some of them the next day after their brain surgery. Okay? Now, that means that you can't have any metal clips or anything. Any, you, know, you have to use sutures and all that other stuff. Um, and so the, here's a patient before anterior temporal lobectomy, and then here it is afterwards. Okay? That's going to transect the fornix. And what we're going to do is use CSF-suppressed DTI. It's a way of acquiring diffusion imaging so that you suppress the signal from cerebral spinal fluid, which if you don't, you're not going to be able to track the fornix very well, and it's going to contaminate all your diffusion measurements of the fornix. And basically, you're transecting it. And what we're going to do is uh, track the fornix and ask the question, how does the DTI parameters change in the first few days? And so these might be a bit tricky to look at, and we'll look at some plots afterwards. But here's FA. So FA looks pretty, pretty good, actually. So you've just transected this fornix, and it doesn't really change all that much you know, until maybe two months. Kind of surprising, actually. Um, mean diffusivity, on the other hand, so hot colors, again, higher values, um, starts off kind of high and then kind of drops off. So the star indicates the surgery side. Sorry, I should have indicated that. And you can see that it's a bit you know, bluer on that side, and then goes up big time at two months, indicating severe degradation of the tissue structure. Here's lambda parallel. Red, fast parallel diffusion. At two days afterwards, in this patient, it's dropped, parallel diffusion is dropped again, consistent with the idea that the axon's being damaged. And then perpendicular diffusion doesn't show a lot of changes. Uh, sorry. It shows changes at the first time point as well, which actually surprised us at first because we didn't expect any changes, but it didn't go up. It actually went down, opposite of what we saw earlier. And then only at much later stages, two months, does you see the red, does it go uh, way back up. So this is easier to see on, on, on plots. So here's the, the, the different patients, all color-coded differently here. You can see the FA doesn't change too much in that first week, although you know there's some reductions in a few patients. There's always going to be some patient variability. And then you see the FA drops greatly at two to four months, indicating that the tissue is really quite damaged. If you look at mean diffusivity, which is kind of the average diffusion over all directions, you can see in most of the patients, it drops quite significantly. Now, these are all normalized, I should state, sorry, to the very first uh, time point for each patient, just for um, ease, of, e ease of viewing. And then it kind of pseudo-normalizes back up. So, in parallel diffusion, this is interesting, it kind of goes down, and then it increases much, uh, kind of pseudo-normalizes or even goes higher at later time points. So this drop in the parallel diffusion is kind of what we expected. But what we didn't expect was that in several of the cases, you also had a drop in perpendicular diffusion. Okay? And, and that's why we're not seeing these changes in anisotropy, because the parallel and perpendicular diffusion are kind of doing the same thing. Right? So if you only looked at FA in these, in these cases, you wouldn't think there's much going on in this tissue. But if you look at MD and these other diffusion parameters, you can see there's a heck of a lot going on. Right? And we're not sure why the diffusion's reduced in that first week. We don't know if it might be an ischemic-related reduction in diffusion, because we know the main use of diffusion-weighted imaging is to look at acute stroke, where the diffusion coefficient drops by about 40%. Now, these aren't dropping uh, by nearly that much, so we're not exactly sure why perpendicular diffusion is going down. It may have to do something with cellular swelling of the axons or the myelin. We're, not, we're really not too sure at this point. So just two topics more that I'll quickly go through. I still have some time. Um, one of the things that, uh, that's been kind of interesting and was brought to our attention when uh, postdoc Galing Gong joined our lab many years ago, and who's now an assistant professor in, in Beijing, was this idea of, of, of small world networks. And before Galang came, came, I really had never heard of this before. Um, and the idea, as we saw yesterday, for functional networks uh, is, is that you can map out different brain structures, come up with these matrices, and see what's kind of connected. And uh, these two pa papers by uh, Ethereum Medina and NeuroImage kind of talked about um, this kind of idea where you can look at local efficiency and uh, random networks and all this kind of stuff. And then uh, Hagman, as well, at the same time, was looking at small world properties 
where he really segmented the brain into a lot of different regions, like 500 to 4,000 nodes, looked at two healthy subjects, you know, more of a kind of idea proof of principle, and showed uh, that it behaved as a, that the tractography indicated a kind of a small world uh, network. Uh, what Galang decided to do is looked at 80 of our right-handed young adults between 18 and 31 to try to get an idea of what the backbone network, if you will. So he wasn't happy that there was just two subjects. Let's look at 80 subjects. And then he used an AL template um, just to keep the number of nodes kind of manageable, if you will. I mean, even this is pretty tough to, to digest and look at and get anything out of it. Um, and, and by doing this, you then do, do whole brain tractography. And this is just streamlined deterministic tractography. So it's going to be missing quite a few connections that actually exist. Um, so there are going to be errors, no doubt. Tractography is not perfect. And then what you can do is then calculate a bunch of different um, parameters from that and, and use that to try to compare patients and so on. And, and the kind of idea is that you want to look at kind of the, what, what are the hubs. And we saw that yesterday. And this is Air Canada's uh, flight network. And the hubs are kind of Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal. And um, there's actually uh, there's, there's a big hole right, right down here where we are. Um, and what, what he found was that if he mapped out some of the brain's hubs based on various parameters and so on, these areas in kind of yellow and red are areas that he found. He found like the precuneus um, and uh, SFG and, and so on. And you can come up with these kind of interesting looking network maps of what's connected to what and uh, make the size proportional to some connectivity parameter and so on. So, you know, it, it's really kind of an interesting way to uh, examine this type of data. And for the most part, it's pretty automated as well, which is kind of, I guess, one of the appealing things, but it's also not appealing in the sense that I'm sure that there's a lot of uh, errors that are happening as well. Um, and uh, PhD student Min Liu and John Chen, who's here, um, who's a postdoc in our lab who has a poster on a different topic, um, have been trying to apply this to those epilepsy patients that we have with mesial temple sclerosis and trying to address these issues on whether this network analysis tells us anything informative about these patients. And they've, they're kind of showing areas that have reduced regional efficiency. And not surprisingly, a bunch of the areas are in the kind of left temporal lobe, whereas, which is where the pathology is. Um, and then what's interesting, they've kind of correlated that um, uh, efficiency with disease duration and showed a pretty nice correlation. So this might be a, a, a useful way to look at things, um, but it really is a, it's complicated. There's a lot of parameters and a lot of things. There's a lot of ways of how do you weight the nodes, and I don't really know the answer to that. Um, so it's pretty tricky, um, but I think it's an interesting thing to, to keep, continue to pursue. And just the final topic here is on um, high field diffusion imaging. So we saw uh, in yesterday's talk, um, we saw that there is real, real advantages to going to high field and high resolution for fMRI. I mean, those images were beautiful. And I just want to show you some examples that the same thing is going to happen with diffusion. I think later uh, you're going to see from Saad some probably some nice, really high resolution uh, images with the Connectome project. And so the idea is that the higher magnetic fields yield more signal. Okay? And then you can use that, you can spend that signal to either go faster or more likely to get higher resolution, although it doesn't really speed things up. It just takes longer. Um, and so kind of we have this evolution of, of field strengths. And it turns out that we have kind of an, we're kind of the oddball, which goes without saying. But, um, and we have a 4.7 Tesla. So we got this and uh, ordered it in 2000. So seven Teslas weren't quite ready. We already had a three Tesla since 1994. Um, and Peter Allen, who was the director of the lab, said, well, let's, get, let's go for a 4.7. Four is not quite different enough from three. We're not ready for seven. And we're placing this magnet in the emergency wing of a, our University of Alberta hospital. Unshielded 7T wasn't going to fit in the hospital wing very well. You know, four, unshielded 4.7 uh, didn't do all that well either when all the computer screens upstairs in emergency shifted when we ramped the magnet up. Um, but the idea was to put a high field magnet into an emergency wing where we can study acutely ill patients. 
right? And that's where our facility is located. That's why we can do those post-surgical studies on the epilepsy patients, because we're in an emergency wing uh, of our hospital, and it's a purely research-dedicated scanner. But the only problem is, is that we're one of two 4.7 human systems in the world. There's us and Japan. Roger Ordridge used to have one in London, um, but uh, the, the, I think he's jumped up to 17. I think he's moved away as well. In Canada, there's only one 7 Tesla uh, in Western Ontario, but there's a bunch of applications in right now that have uh, requested 7 Teslas. We've not requested a 7 Tesla. We're pretty happy with 4.7. We think it ha holds a little sweet spot, if you will. You get S and R gains from the higher field, but you don't get all the problems at 7 Tesla from tissue heating with SAR, susceptibility, all that stuff. We can do things on a 4.7 you can't do on a 7 Tesla, basically. So, you know, when we first started this, though, years ago, this was kind of one of the first early images from the, uh, you know, our var it's a Varian 4.7, and I, I was not very hopeful <laughs> that we were ever going to be doing diffusion imaging at 4.7. And this is some set early 7 Tesla data, and this was from a high field meeting in, in 2007, so not that long ago, five years, and, you know, these are pretty, pretty ugly, pretty nasty. And then anytime anybody ever showed any nice images, it was just from the top of the brain, right? So classic trick. Um, and, you know, what, what do we have to do to get good images at, at these higher fields? Well, you need shorter T2s. You need to minimize field homogeneities. And luckily, I got this uh, Corey Barron, a current PhD student, who then wrote a new diffusion EPI sequence from scratch. We have a four-element receiver array. Definitely not fancy compared to what MGH has with 64 or 128 receiver arrays for head imaging. We have four but you need it for high field. And we have 60 millitesla per meter gradients. And, whoops, somehow I missed. And so what, I'll just quickly go through this because I'm kind of out of time. Um, this is kind of standard diffusion weighted imaging, not DTI, but di diffusion weighted imaging that you would use in a clinic. So five millimeters thick, one millimeter gap, low voxel volume. You know, they look pretty, you know, look, they look okay on axial slices, but if you look at the other planes, not very nice. However, at 4.7, we can get with 1.5 millimeter isotropic resolution. Now you can really see nice detail. You can see the cortex. Looks really great. Distortions aren't too bad. And a voxel volume of 3.4 millimeter cubed. And so really uh, good quality data that you can get um, with this homegrown system. And right now we're getting, uh, you know, you can do DTI. These are 1.7 millimeter isotropic, uh, about 4.9 millimeter cubed, 30 diffusion directions. Um, everybody will be happy because for, for the last decade we've been doing six directions. This will please everyone. And um, only in eight minutes to get the full brain, 1.7 millimeter isotropic. So very usable because what we, we do is we do a lot of applications to patients. You can't take a 50 minute scan in a patient population. You need something that's reasonable, and this is something that's quite reasonable and is much better than what's currently being done typically. And if you do that, you can get some pretty nice tractography. So here's the fornix, and we can track it even without CSF suppression. You can see some holes here due to CSF, um, and then here's the cingulum. So we really think there's a real future for high-resolution diffusion, and, and I think it's really just getting, getting started. So just to finish up, I hope I've convinced you that you know, diffusion parameters, while not very specific, can still detect changes in the brain, white matter associated with, and I showed some aging, some disease, some injury, and, and still be very informative of what's happening at the microstructural level. Most of this data, uh, back to the KISS principle, used really the simplest of tensor protocols, six directions, and deterministic streamlined tractography, nothing fancy. Um, and that there's more to diffusion than anisotropy. I think that's important, and that there's a lot of advances going forward in terms of the protocols, analysis, and applications, and you're going to hear about that later, later today. So the hope is that diffusion imaging is actually providing us some information and, and deciphering, uh, you know, splitting the light into the different microstructural components, and I guess we have to be energy efficient. So, all right, so finally, I'd just like to acknowledge um, you know, a lot of people, the students and so on, and my collaborators, clinical collaborators, which really enables these type of clinical studies, which I find very uh, interesting and very important. Um, this was for the neurodevelopment work, and then uh, the epilepsy group, and then Corey, who wrote the high uh, resolution sequences. And if you ever want to come to Alberta, you can either have mountains or you can have prairies. So I'd be happy to uh, answer any uh, questions at this time. <laughs>
Yeah, it's a small question. Uh, you know, by definition, I think FA is between zero and one. I saw, uh, you got some negative FA values. I'm no, no, those were all normalized. So what we did is we took the FA value uh, from time point one, pre-surgical, and then subtracted that from all the follow-up time points. Oh, I see. So if it was a negative FA, it was the FA went down okay. from the initial time point. Sorry, should have made that clear. Oh, that's fine. So Christian, that was a really nice talk. We had a long discussion about motion problems in uh, functional imaging, and as you push down to the smaller voxel sizes, my understanding, I don't know that much about DDI, is there's another whole raft of motion problems when you're measuring 30 directions in you know, three cubic millimeter voxels. So can you comment on that? I mean, is, is this a correct understanding, for example? Uh, well, I mean, motion's always going to be, I mean, diffusion's extra sensitive to motion, right? If you have uh, any motion, it's going to just basically corrupt your, you know, entire image typically. I mean, we do use single shot EPI, so it kind of freezes the motion. So if there is motion between directions and shots, it's going to be a bit of a problem because the direction that you think you're measuring diffusion uh, with the gradients that you have applied, if the head's moved during one of those shots and then it's moved back, you know, it's not going to be correct. But you can you know, view all your images and, and, and correct for that type of stuff. Um, but basically, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a concern, but it, it's quite robust and works reasonably well. I mean, you are going to lose data uh, from motion. There's not a lot you can do about it, to, to be honest. I mean, yeah, you can try to correct for any motion, but if you have too severe a motion, you're just going to lose all the intensity in the image and you're just going to get nothing and then you'll just avoid that image. So hopefully you're overdetermined, you acquire more averages, you can throw out some of the bad data, and then calculate your maps, and, and so on. Um, it's, it's one of the things we're gonna try to be developing in the near future is more multi-shot images where are gonna be more sensitive to motion, uh, and then we'll have to use correction strategies, navigators, and so on, in order to correct for the motion that's for certain, certain gonna happen. So I was particularly interested because you've done such a large number of clinical subjects, uh, but maybe they were all six directions, so it's not quite such an issue. And I, I don't know when you moved to the 1.7 with the 30 directions, where presumably it's more of an issue. And uh, when you're trying to scan someone who's just had epilepsy surgery uh, or someone who's 80 years old, they can't hold their heads still. We, we pack them in pretty good. Okay, so it's, so, it's a tech, so basically <laughs> technique issues in yeah. setting up for the scan. Yeah, I mean, you know, and that's a, that's a practical thing for everybody. I mean, we, you know, we, we really put a lot of padding around. I mean, it still has to be comfortable for the patient, obviously, um, but that's, we don't, we, we're not doing these like crazy long protocols either, right? I mean, some people doing really high resolution uh, diffusion imaging you know, at one millimeter isotropic or, or taking an hour and 20 minutes to just get the one scan. You know, we're trying to do a whole pile of different things in 20 minutes, <laughs> right? Including DTI and, uh, and other stuff. And so our protocols are anywhere from, some of our stroke DTI protocols are just a couple of minutes. And then our, you know, we've been scanning kids as young as five with fetal alcohol disorder, who are about the fidgetiest subject you could probably imagine. And Sure, about 25% of them, you're not going to get usable data, but you just know that going in. Um, and then the rest, uh, it works surprisingly well, and the scan's six minutes long for the diffusion acquisition. So, uh, you know, I think it's possible uh, to, to, to do that. And, it, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's kind of a pragmatic approach. You just have to run it and hope for the best and prepare them as best as possible so they, they can't move, basically. Yeah, I had a question. Um, that's a beautiful set of studies. Uh, I had a question about the, the one where you showed the fornix degeneration where uh, people had the hippocampus, uh, hippocampus sclerosis. Mm -hmm. um, 
can you speculate on, uh, or, or have you been thinking about what comes first? Because that's kind of an interpretation of the data. I don't know if you, you uh, how deep you went into that interpretation, but that's a... Uh, yeah, well, you know, the, the whole temporal lobe epilepsy project started uh, with uh, the adult director of the epilepsy clinic, Don Gross, who came to me and said, well, I, I want to look at uh, focal cortical dysplasias and stuff. And, and um, I said, well, I don't know anything about that. I said, but I do DTI. <laughs> he said, okay. What can that do? I said, well, no, we can look at white matter tracks. He's like, can you look at the limbic system? It's like, yeah, sure, we can. How about the fornix? Probably. And so we started off with the idea of doing tractography to actually uh, lateralize the epilepsy. And what we ended up finding was quite surprising was that um, the fornix in, in this is before surgery is actually reduced bilaterally. So it's not just on the unilateral side of the seizures. And that indicates to us that it's not likely a downstream degeneration of this bad hippocampus, but it may be actually a pre-existing kind of one of the first hits, if you will, of maybe making somebody susceptible to developing the disorder in the first place, right? So if you have a poor connectivity, you're more uh, uh, susceptible to getting the epilepsy because of this bilateral right. nature. Uh, so I don't know if that answered your question, but, but that's kind of how we've been approaching uh, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see that uh, that could be uh, uh, Did that answer one of the your options. Question? In your later study, you showed the longitudinal degeneration or uh, changes in yeah. uh, after the tra transaction. Yeah. So the, and uh, so you you will see longitudinal changes in FA in in a bundle like that mm -hmm. uh, while after it has been cut. So that kind of tells you that. Uh, if the tract is not used, then it slowly degenerates. Well, I mean, you've transected the tract, so all the axonal transport and everything down the tract, I mean, it's, it's just a mess. It's just that malaria degeneration takes quite a long time to actually occur. In fact, uh, a lot of conventional imaging doesn't detect malaria degeneration till months later, mm -hmm. whereas the diffusion is showing changes uh, right away, which is actually one of the reasons that we're using it. Um, like a lot of the pre earlier animal uh, studies where you've transected uh, axons show that these diffusion changes occur uh, quite early on. Um, but so, yeah. I think, so I think it's not comparable. I think it's, it's, no, very, okay, it's very okay. different. Yeah, it would be really cool to uh, get some maybe people who are uh, prone to develop uh, the, the, the hippocampus sclerosis, image them really early before Sclerosis. Yeah, well, we've been trying to do this in kids, in kids for years, but uh, kids is much more challenging. They're a much more diverse group. We've also scanned uh, um, kind of young adults with, uh, that have a history of febrile seizures. So febrile seizures is, is in, you know, a lot of people that have epilepsy, temporal lobe epilepsy, have a history of febrile seizures. But not everybody that has a febrile seizure develops epilepsy. Um, and so what we've done is done a DTI study on people with febrile seizures and uh, their white matter tracks actually look just fine. Mm -hmm. So that kind of put that uh, question out. Yeah. Uh, so we're still trying to figure it out. But you know, the only way to really do it, it would be, like you said, to start scanning people really young yeah, yeah. and then see who gets epilepsy in the future. But that's not a very easy project to do. No, no, no. But still a really cool, cool project and nice of the longitudinal data. Yeah, I mean, there's not, what, 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 what I think is interesting about the post-surgical stuff is there's not a lot of conditions where you can, you know, that where you have neurosurgical cases other than like, like a brain tumor, you know, you could try to do this type of work, but then it's a bit of a mess. Um, whereas this, I mean, the, the brain's essentially all kind of, you know, you don't have a, a mass in there displacing things and stuff. So you can actually do a really nice, careful studies, you know where the, le where the cuts are, what tracks are injured, and you can follow it over time. And so it's, a, it's the epilepsy patients are the perfect group to, to do this type of, of work. There may be other patient groups as well, I guess. I was wondering about, about FA, because when, when you look at FA, one of the big problems with FA is that if you just uh, compute the value of FA conditional to the three eigenvalues that, that you've got. Wh what we have is that you have widely different uh, a configuration of eigenvalues that will give you the same FA. I mean, mm -hmm. you, 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 you can have almost the same value for complete sphericity and, and with just one dimension, which is something like frightening. Mm 
So what are your thoughts about that? Should we abandon FA and work straight on the eigenvalues, like, like you are suggesting, or should we even go below and, and, and try to use directly the direction that we have? What, what, what do you think is, is one way of going over there? Or? I mean, p people have tried to propose alternative you know, uh, strategies to, to kind of calculate mm -hmm. the anisotropy. In, in my old uh, early 90s PhD work, we just used the ratio of parallel over perpendicular, mm -hmm. just that ratio, simple enough. So one over uh, uh, two just plus three. Lambda yeah. parallel over lambda mm -hmm. perpendicular, mm -hmm. uh, that was it. Because we had a, a nerve that we uh, dissected out of a squid or a garfish mm -hmm. or a frog, and we just lined it up with the, uh, All with, with, with the uh, gradients. Mm -hmm. And so we just measured once, twice, mm -hmm. and calculated our anisotropy. Um, it's only when you introduce the idea that you didn't know what direction the nerve was that you then had to introduce this mm -hmm. kind of rotationally invariant reference frame and FA came out of all that. Um, I think you still need something that, that quantifies the relative differences between the parallel and perpendicular. So I, I wouldn't abandon, um, I wouldn't just look at lambda one, lambda two, and lambda three. I think the relative differences, I think, still provides uh, you know, some information with that. Um, but if there's a better way to kind of come up with that, um, I mean, I'm sure the field would be very happy. No, but I was wondering if you had played with that and tried to find it. If, because in, in some of your no. slides, that was, you, you were just showing that, in fact, not looking at FA was, was, was a good idea or, or looking at something. Yeah, well, I think so I was wondering if you had a... Yeah, I think the point is, I mean, and I think this is something that maybe all the, maybe the statisticians could, could, uh, could comment on, is part of the problem is that when you do a patient study mm -hmm. and you look at 20 tracks, and then you have FA, MD, lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, and then you have a bunch of cognitive scores you want to correlate to. You get into this massive multiple comparison problem where, and this was discussed yesterday, I think you discussed it as well, where uh, you know um, reviewers get upset and then you're putting these ridiculous p-values, where's p-values, um, and, um, and, and then you know, you're just losing all your information but then, and so what people do is they say, okay, we're just gonna look at FA just to keep things simple and they just ignore everything else. So you, you're kind of, we're kind of get caught in a position where you can get too many numbers, mm -hmm. basically. And Although all, all that is a problem that can be easily solved by correct statistical analysis. Yeah, but I, I think that mu much of our field doesn't know what that is, mm -hmm. including <laughs> myself. Um, and so, so I think what, what's happening is that people are focusing on specific uh, parameters mm -hmm. and then ignoring everything else. Or you, you might use FA and say what tracks are different in FA and then say, okay, I'm gonna try to then understand why FA changed in those tracks mm -hmm. and then you look at the eigenvalues as opposed to doing a full complete analysis of all your mm -hmm. parameters for everything. Uh, so people aren't doing that. And plus the, pa the papers would end up being a bit of a mess as well. So you know, I don't really know what the answer is, but it is a it is a bit of a problem mm -hmm. uh, in in the presentation or in the investigation of this type of data. What was Dr. Abdi's solution? Oh, no, I, I, I couldn't hear it. If, <laughs> so, so what, what I'm currently doing is, in fact, trying to redo the analysis, taking actually the eigenvalues and using multi-table multi-table approach, which we're just working on that. Yeah. Uh, we've studied that something like a month ago or so, so I yeah. just wanted to know if you had some. Yeah, I mean, they're time. probably correlated, so you shouldn't take a total hit. It's not like you're doubling your degrees of freedom. I no, but, but I was really thinking about getting re literally not using FA, because when you do simulations, if you just plot your, your eigenvalues and look at the value of FA, you'll find something that is striking is that you, you have widely different uh, a pattern, you know, literally going from almost complete sphericity to unidimensionality that will map on the same FA. Yeah. So therefore, they give, when you look in terms of a measurement, FA is a bad measurement because you cannot invert FA. Yeah, I mean, so I think. That, so that was the, so I was just wondering, you no, know, but when, uh, when we started to look at that, you should think, wow, that's, that's, uh, when, uh, very often when I I'd looked in the past on, on uh, using FA with a uh, brain traumatic injury, uh, just to see if we could predict or have an idea of what was going on after. And what we found, for example, was that just when you have a scan, just right uh, at the time of the injury, well, it's not that great because the, you, you don't see where the problem is. You wait your three months and then indeed, then you, you, you have all the, probably the generation yeah. and so on. I mean, I think part of the problem is that the lambda one, lambda two, and lambda mm -hmm. three are absolute numbers, right? They're millimeters squared mm -hmm. per second. So what th that actually has quite a bit more variability mm -hmm. between yeah, yeah. subjects and tissue than FA does, a unitless parameter, which is a ratio of everything else. No, no, else. you're right. There, there was right? a need, clear need for normalization there. Right, so, so that's, a bit, that's, that's the biggest problem with looking at the eigenvalues is that because they're an absolute number, uh, that there's much more variability in that 
than the, the relative ratio. So somebody has a bit more watery brain or a little bit less watery brain, but all the ratio of the, uh, the eigenvalues are the same, then they still have the same anisotropy, but much different uh, underlying eigenvalues. And so for a lot of the population studies, I think uh, these unitless parameters like FA help with that out. But, but if, you know, if you have a uh, you know, magic hat and some more magic, then I'm sure the DTI community would appreciate it. No, we can talk about that at some of the breaks. Sure. Sure. Okay, uh, since you mentioned watery brain, um, from your experience, are there any factors like consumption of coffee or any other drinks before the session of scanning? Does it have an effect on the readings? I don't know. If, if somebody did a DTI of my brain after the red wine we consumed last night, I'm sure it would have been less watery. Um, <laughs> no, I don't think, I, I've not seen any studies um, looking at that, at, at you know, uh, effects of caffeine on diffusion parameters, at least. I know some of you see I've not seen anything like that. You haven't seen them or you don't observe them? I mean, so it just... We don't, take, we don't keep track of it, Okay. basically. Uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, to be honest, I mean, we don't even, you know, we don't even take, uh, uh, like, uh, race into account. You know, we, we, we put everybody together, right? And even gender, we don't see major differences, actually, in DTI parameters. So it turns out that for a lot of these things, um, you know, we, we, d we don't factor any of that stuff out. Uh, so caffeine would have a pretty small effect. Right. It just, I remember there were studies in functional imaging, right, on the effects of ca caffeine, at least, and there was effect, right? So I just wondered what else could contribute to the variance you see oh, yeah. in the population, oh, and I see. maybe especially in through longitudinal studies. Yeah, right? I don't think it's much of an issue for the 5 to 13-year-olds, but... And um, especially for people who <laughs> Maybe are the amount hospital. of sugar they had for breakfast, but... Yeah, but also remember, if you're doing functional studies... You mean functional fMRI? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, uh, caffeine and things like that will uh, affect your cognition, that's for sure. So that's why you will expect changes in your but brain function. But, but this is... a that it's interesting if, if that water at that level, is that related to what you drink five minutes before? I, I don't know. It could be, but uh, you expect it not to be. I mean, I don't know. No, you don't know. Okay, well. I won't do the study either. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to know. Uh, level. Okay, and since you rehearsed on this functional question, either what functional, are you a believer that DTI effects could be observed due to functional changes or like neuronal? sweating or whatever, swelling, right? So there were studies where they mm -hmm. took DTI in two conditions while doing some task. Yeah, no, I mean, I think there, there's been some nice st studies out of a uh, bunch of different groups that have shown that there's likely an effect of uh, blood oxygenation effects on diffusion. So diffusion measurements are sensitive to paramagnetic effects as well. And, um, and so uh, it, it's likely an indirect uh, marker of just the changes in the oxygenation as opposed to a true diffusion effect. But then you have, there are a few groups that are still pushing forward with investigating that. Um, I mean, there, you know, there, there's old studies uh, where people uh, caused neurons to swell and, and so on and made measurements on them, you know, in a, in a petri dish and didn't show any uh, changes, let alone um, whatever small changes might occur when you're doing uh, some functional activation. So. I wouldn't say I'm, I'm a believer, but I wouldn't also say that it's not worth pursuing either.